March 2020. And this is API Conversation number 18 with Kurt Collins. This is your host and producer, Paul Carr. Kurt is probably best known for his work researching and writing about the Cash Landrum case that took place in Southeast Texas almost 40 years ago. He was, as we'll briefly discuss, also involved with investigating and solving the famous debacle known as the Roswell Slides. I've been wanting to get Kurt Collins on conversations for more than two years now, but two recent articles he has published with Roger Glassall on his blog, Blue Blurry Lines, prompted me to finally set up a date to talk. These articles were about the complicated relationship between the DOD's Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, or AATIP, funded by then Senator Harry Reid of Nevada, a contract awarded to Reid's friend Robert Bigelow under that program that was called AWSAP, or the Advanced Aerospace Weapon Systems Application Program, a contract awarded by Bigelow to MUFON, and internal strife within MUFON. It is completely understandable if you find this confusing so far, and that's because it is confusing. I have quite a few links in the show notes at apicasefiles.com that provide more of the puzzle pieces. We talk about such things as the Carpenter Affair and Simone Mendez, and you can learn more about those sad chapters by following those links. I wanted to talk to Kurt about all that, among other things. So, here we are. I'm here with Kurt Collins of the blog Blue Blurry Lines. I hope I pronounced that right. Blue Blurry Lines. Yep. Uh, Kurt, say hello. Hi, glad to be on your show. Kurt, uh, welcome to API Conversations. And let's start with sort of who is Kurt Collins and how did he end up start blogging about this crazy stuff? Oh, boy. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I've, I've said it a few times, and I guess the easiest way to un understand is I'm kind of a UFO Rip Van Winkle. I was uh, just obsessed with the topic as a kid, but as uh, graduating uh, high school and moving into the workforce, kind of lost touch with the topic for probably 20 years or more and straight back into it in 2011. And, you know, in the meantime, I would, you know, would pick up some different things with TV shows and, and, um, and probably the X-Files, which I recognized a lot of things from real UFO cases, but so there, you know, it was out of what we would consider ufology. And, um, but then uh, coming in 2011, I really became interested in um, the cases, both what was genuine, what wasn't. And I got interested in the Cash Lantern case because it seemed like there were enough elements of that, the government involvement. Um, there seemed to be credible witnesses. There were, there were things that could be investigated and tracked down, documented. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just a story. Like so many things are solely witness reports or other things you could, in that case, there were military helicopters. You could try to trace where those came from or where they went. And so that that's that's really what – that's how ufology got its hooks back into me. Mm -hmm. And I know you've written a lot about the Cash Landrum case on your blog. You were one of the folks involved with the Roswell Slide investigation, as I recall. That's right. That's uh, That's one of a few times where I sort of got dragged into things because my friends were interested in it. Uh, it didn't, you know, the situation didn't really interest me that much, but it, it was another puzzle. And so, you know, we wanted to figure out what was, what was going on with that. And um, Roger Glassell, who we'll be talking about later, he was in the group. Uh, we, it was just, a, it, it was already a, a group of friends that were, you know, what with shared interests in UFOs. We had a little Facebook group where we had private discussions and that's, that's how that all started. You know, there were several other people, uh, Isaac Coy, Chris Rutkowski, um, uh, Nablader. Um, oh, and I'm going blank, but oh, Paul Kimball was in there at the time, mm -hmm. um, a number of other people. And it was a collaborative effort. And we, we eventually got lucky. We got copies of, uh, of these, um, 
I'm sure everyone knows a little bit about this, the Roswell yeah. slides. It was supposed to be a, a, a crash, um, the Roswell crash, a, a body photograph from that. And it, um, there was a, a, they call it a placard in one of the, the slides. And we got a copy of that. And uh, NAB later took this and used this smart Dibler software and was able, and it almost looked like uh, foreign writing, possibly alien writing. But what it really was, was it was from the camera shake and it was just blurry text. And with this software, which is something fairly simple, um, you, you were able to clearly read and it said, mummified body of two year old boy. It was Native, Amer Native American boy whose remains were on uh, display in a museum. And it was a tourist photo. I mean, there was nothing whatsoever connected to Roswell, extraterrestrials or anything. It was just totally misrepresented. And, you know, we can't be certain if it was a mistake or it was a hoax, but it was a, you know, it was, it was a real fiasco. And that, um, you know, it misled a lot of people. There was a lot of money made off the event that promoted it. And uh, so, but, but it took a team of us to get to the bottom of that. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of shared work, investigation and late hours to, to bring that all together. That was, well, I mean, the slides were not, were nothing like a success, but your, I think your research was uh, that, but now in uh, recent years, I think your attention has shifted a bit more and I want to get into the, the work you've done, recent work you've done with Roger Glassell. Yeah, you and Roger Glassell have been looking into some of the details of the interaction between different entities uh, during the, the so-called – well, I, I, let, let's try to clear up the confusion a little bit here. Harry Reid got, got a little bit of money uh, that he wanted the DOD to spend on UFO studies. At least that's how he thought it was going to be spent. Is that am I am I right so far? That was uh, well. That's his version of the story. Now yeah. you know. So far, we don't have documentation to prove that. But it, supposedly, um, a um, government official approached him, went to Skinwalker Ranch, and agreed to do UFO research. Although the and it's um, uh, Dr. James. Le Lataski, Lakatsky, I'm, I'm not sure how Lekatsky, to pronounce it. yeah. Yeah, he's the one that, that uh, he wrote the proposal for the, the government program. And if, if what the story we've heard is true, he disguised the program using generic scientific language about aerospace propulsion to conceal the fact that the government would be funding UFO research. So, yeah, and, and well, that, that, that's, that strikes me as completely plausible that he would do that. Because uh, if you say we're going to go chase UFOs, <laughs> you probably, you know, but that's what Harry thought he was paying for. Right. And he, he did it kind of at Bigelow's request bequest. That's right. They were friends. And if, if you look yes. at the timeline, Robert Bigelow, the, the aerospace billionaire, you know, who had a long history of UFO research prior to this. Right. He put together this company, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies before the contract was actually listed by the government. So, I mean, we can we can see that that happened in uh, December of 2007, and the contract didn't come together until September 2008. Mm -hmm. And the company seems to be billed to fulfill that contract. So that would suggest some kind of prior knowledge. Now, now the hiring of the people at, at Bigelow Airspace, and the, and it's called Bass, by the way. Yeah, uh, that's the, that's how we can refer to it. But yeah, we'll, it, we'll it's a, it's kind of a separate entity from Bigelow Aerospace, but it right. under, under the same business umbrella, I guess. Uh, yeah, and and he eventually hired uh, a team of about fifty scientists and things, but not only, yeah, but that was he waited until the contract was was secured and the money was flowing to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, that's how, that's how that began. But there's another, the other interesting part of that is as soon as the, probably before the ink was dry on the, the contract, he approached John Schusler, who was the co-founder and former director of uh, the Mutual UFO Network and asked if they would be interested in conducting research. And, and what he was asking them to do 
was what he had been contracted to do, which was to do uh, to, to write 12 papers in 12 areas, lift, propulsion, um, one was sort of like a stealth area. And, and, you know, this is the same language we're talking about that was concealed. Mm-hmm. It, probably UFO research, but in aerospace, uh, advanced aerospace terms. Right. Now, uh, MUFON does, essentially they do field investigation of UFO reports. Uh, they are not a science lab, uh, or am, am I getting that wrong? No, they're, um, they are, it, it's a civilian organization and it's uh, volunteer based. Now, while they have members that are scientists and some scientific consultants, they, they have basically a shoestring budget. And I, I mean, all UFO research is done on the cheap for the oh, most yes. part. So, um, no, they don't, they didn't have elaborate facilities, you know, far from it. Um, you know, they basically rely on donations. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they, um, most of the, well, I'd say all but, all but maybe one or two people are, are volunteers, right? Uh, That's right. There's a, the, and, and it's not a, even the, the uh, executive director used to be called international director is um, you know, that's, that's not a um, well, it doesn't compare well to corporate salaries. We'll just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now this is when James Carrion was, was international director. That's right. He had, uh, and and, you know, he was, he was young uh, and and John Schusler was probably in his sixties at the time. So it was almost like, you know, grandpa handing it over to a kid, um, you know, I'm sliding carrying his expertise. I mean, he was, he had uh, worked as a military analyst. I mean, you know, he was, he was working as, as a professional. Um, but again, this is basically a volunteer position that he had taken on. And he had, he came in at, in 2006 and this proposal came up in 2000, 2008. And he had been doing a lot of proactive things with MUFON. He had formed um, a project to scan a digital scan of all their files, so it you know could be. He was bringing them into the 20th century, basically. Mm. And he also had launched this. Uh, I'm not sure if it was his idea, but under his administration, this uh, uh, star team, which did field investigations, and the idea was they would go do on the spot investigations. And this, I said, their normal field investigators are the basic volunteers we were talking about. They have some training. This would be a more elite group and they would go out there with evidence kits. And, you know, it was supposed to be more like a professional organization right. or, or investigation rather. Now, and Car- Carrie had started that, that before, something. before there was funding from Bigelow. That's right. That, but that's, that's why they didn't get off the ground. But when, when Robert Bigelow came in, um, I want to, before we go into the star team, I want to talk about the first thing he asked for. So, so I mentioned he approached John Schuster. Well, John Schuster was the only person in MUFON that was aware that, that Robert Bigelow was backed by the, by the government, the defense mm. intelligence agency. He was the only one aware of the contract and he kept that secret from everyone else. And he said that Bigelow had a sponsor and who knows what they thought that meant. If it was a secret partnership with Lockheed or what, and, and the, the cover story they were told was that he was interested in the flight characteristics of UFOs and he wanted to benefit from this knowledge and use it to build aircraft for Bigelow Aerospace to get a competitive edge. So why they thought that was okay, I don't know, but they went along with it. And, um, the first thing he asked for was those 12 technical papers and they, and they put to, and this is, this is something that was newly disco- disclosed in our report that the, the star team relationship was known, but this, uh, they put together this team called the, um, the MUFON. Oh boy. Let me find the, was it made on advanced technology establishment yeah. mate is what they call yeah. it. And, uh, it was put, it was put together. Some of the people on it were uh, board members, they may have all been. Well, I've got their names here. 
it may not mean anything to your, to your listeners, but Dr. Bob Wood, who is a former McDonnell Douglas engineer, uh, Charles W. Maudlin, Robert Powell, and uh, Chuck Reaver were uh, the primary ones writing these, these studies. And they were, they were given a, a short time frame. They only had a month to do it, and they were to be paid, um, oh, I think it was $2,000 a paper. And, but they got, they got five papers done and were paid $10,000 for it. And that was, there was a whole contract written and weeks of negotiation and they only had a month to do it, but they delivered it on time. And apparently Robert Bigelow was happy. Strangely, he did not ask for the rest of the topics to be covered. He immediately changed into what we were just talking about. He wanted the star team to um, investigate UFO cases and if they found anything, he wanted the big little labs to, to um, process it, analyze it. And in addition to that, he wanted information. He wanted access to the case, man- case management system. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, the CMS. It's, right. So it's, it's an online database. Uh, you know, if you have a UFO report, you can, you can go on your computer, you type in the report, and it, it's online in, in seconds. So it, it, has, uh, it, it has historical reports and up to the minute reports. Well, they would, what, what an average person can do is, is see the location, the case number, all this basic information. But field investigators also have witness data, names, contact information. And Robert Bigelow wanted access to that. And so in, in this contract, MUFON would be paid $56,000 a month for the field reports and access to the case management system. And with that money, MUFON, uh, instead of volunteers, they had a team of field investigators that were operational 24-7 and could be deployed if there was a high-quality sighting that needed to be investigated. Wow. And you know, I've, I can't recall how many people, but there were, there were suddenly people doing full-time paid UFO investigations. And that was something radically different. Right. And now uh, $56,000 a month to move on must have seemed like really big bucks. And Oh yeah, it was, but they didn't actually, they didn't actually get that much money. I mean, out of the deal, did they? I mean, well, the, it, it's strange the way that, that everything was set up. MUFON thought that they would benefit from this and would be able to use any excess funds for operational expenses. Mm-hmm. And they thought it would be good for the health of the organization. And the, the discussion of the money is interesting too, because the, the, um, and the information that we received, which were a bunch of documents, that, copies of the contracts, some internal board emails. And in their discussions, they were talking about how this may violate the terms or the spirit of their um, nonprofit status as an educational organization. And they basically, and I don't know if what a tax lawyer would say, but they thought that since the money would be gone for the good of the organization to conduct the research, that that was okay. And secondly, they really needed the money. Right. Well, I've worked for a nonprofit before and I can tell you, they have no problem taking money. <laughs> they, they they'll spend it. Uh, their their costs tend to be a little bit higher than than private companies, but uh, you know, and oh, there's oh, there, are, there are a lot of nonprofits that run government labs. So, yeah. The, but this money, um, Bigelow wanted every dollar to go to field investigations, but they did not always have enough things happening. I mean, this also includes travel expense and so forth. Yeah. The, the money that was left over, um, he, he didn't want them to have that. I see. And eventually once he saw there was excess, he cut the funding and it, it strained relations and MUFON said, well, this is not what we've contracted for. And it, it fell apart in the course of what well, started right. in, um, uh, March of one year and ended in January uh, 2010, and that it fell apart then. And and when it did, all those people that had been hired were suddenly out of jobs. And and Mufon, who had built their organization 
rebuilt it around these these funds that were coming in. They were they were basically left crippled and broke. And due to the fact that everyone had to sign a non disclosure agreement, they couldn't say why they were in this terrible uh, situation, which was you know a huge embarrassment to them because they had done all this huge uh, promotion about this team and the investigations, and you know suddenly it was kaput. Right now, uh, we knew. Okay, let me try to recap here. We knew back uh, some years ago about the that Bigelow had a contract with Mufon, uh, and we knew three years ago that about the OSAP program and the AATIP program that that Bigelow was the prime contractor on. Uh, so, but what what's new is is this information about. Um, the Schistler knew that about there was a government sponsor. He didn't tell anyone, or is there more to it? Well, that it, you're right. So, so it basically came out in 2017 in the New York Times story. But at that time, remember the UFO videos, the Nimitz and the other one were released, and that that stole all the attention. And most people, you know, right. weren't asking questions about well, what what did Robert Bigelow do, and what, what's recently changed was there was a story by Tim McMillan at Popular Mechanics released in uh, February 14th. Right. And he, he produced, uh, he was shown, uh, given access. He didn't get a copy of something called the Bass 10 month report. Right. And that, and it, that was uh, produced in July, 2009. And in it, you know, he lists some of the contents and one of it was, um, about a MUFON star team case. So, so then all of a sudden we had, we had proof that MUFON material had been processed by Bigelow and delivered to the government. And that's, that's what got Roger asking questions. He wanted to know, can we find out what this case was? Can we find out, you know, did MUFON receive a copy of this report to see what was done with their information? There was those kind of questions that led to our investigation. And we found out, you know, we found out other things, specific things. We have those, those reports I was telling you about the, uh, the mate papers. We right. have copies of four of those, and those are included uh, in a PDF and a link to the, to the article. So we have lots more information about this. And the thing is, this was all basically covered up. MUFON has not said a word about the fact they were involved in this government contract knowingly or unknowingly. And we believe that it was unknowingly, except for uh, John Schusler. Mm -hmm. um, and the there, there are many other aspects that relate to the government involvement, including I mentioned the case management system. Well, when a when a UFO witness, they can choose to remain anonymous, but some of them do give their names. Well, they didn't know that the government or a third party like Bass could potentially have access to the personal information. And that's the invasion of privacy that they didn't sign up for. And, you know, that maybe nothing was done with it that's sinister. But, you know, anytime your personal information is goes somewhere where you don't want it to, that's a concern. Well, that harkens back to the 90s and the Carpenter affair, right? When uh, Bigelow purchased MUFON case files from the then head of uh, adduction research at MUFON. That's true. And I, we don't think the government was involved with that, but you know, that's another sad example. And, you know, here we have the same players involved. So, uh, maybe, and, and in fact, I suspect this Carpenter affair that you mentioned is that opened the door for this particular deal. They'd worked with him before they benefited from the finances. So, uh, it happened again. And I, I, I think it's, I've, uh, I've talked with some people. I talked with Kevin Randall. He didn't think that the government angle was particularly sinister, but you know, typically ufology has re regarded the government as the bad guy. They're the ones that are keeping the UFO secrets and, you know, for them to be involved in this is, um, well, you know, I, I personally think it's a betrayal. I think it's a huge concern. Right. And, and now, presently, no one at MUFON is, is saying anything about this or responding to your article, are they? 
except, except that not, you're a... not at first. It it took some it took some doing. We we were able to reach um, James Carrion, right? And um, you know, first the first thing we did was ask him about what's what about this report? Can you tell us anything? And we did. And basically, we got no answer from from the director Jan Harzan. No, none from the board of the directors, none, nothing from John Schuessler. I got a, a, a Rob, uh, Rob Swiatek from, um, he's on the board of directors. He, he gave me an answer about the case because he wanted to f- help us find the case. So, and he talked about in general terms of what, about the information MUFON had sent to uh, Bigelow. We also reached um, Robert, uh, Robert Powell, who was one of the authors of the papers. And originally, he just said, go, go see, um, you know, ask Jan Harzan or Carrion. And when we revealed to him that we knew about the MATE program, he, uh, he said that he, he couldn't talk about it. But he did eventually say, yes, I was part of this, and, um, but I'm bound by NDA, and I, I can't talk about it. Hmm. So, you know, he admits that, that he was part of it. Um, a few other people responded. Um, um, Tom Dooley responded, but did not want his comments published. But you know, he was he was concerned that that so often the UFO topic or MUFON gets smeared, and he just didn't want to get involved in you know anything like that. But but the principal people have not the people who should be talking. The public face of MUFON, Jan Harzan. Has, has not acknowledged the con, uh, the contract to my uh, awareness. Right now, um, the mate program that struck me as really odd. It, it almost like uh, Big Law was using them to check a box, so he could then move on to field to field investigation. Uh, hey, look, I got these technical reports to move on, you know. So, you know. That's how the money's being spent. But uh, I mean, and, and I and I frankly, I've looked at the dirds that were published by other people uh, working under Bigelow, presumably, and uh, I tracked down a few of those. And uh, by the by, looking at who the authors and the, what the topics were, I would think if they spent more than you know hundred thousand dollars or so on those, they they. They spent way too much. Uh, they're they're really just status reports, and you you wonder, okay, th- how much money did Bigelow really get for OSAP, and how did he really spend it? That's really my question. And he didn't spend a ton of it on Mufon, right? I mean, yeah, that's a good question, and and we we have more information. I think we have more information than the Pentagon, frankly, because they've issued a statement saying that the uh, the papers are what the twenty two million was spent on, and that's uh, that's a horrible ratio. Yeah, for, you know, millions per th- you know for thirty eight twenty two million for thirty eight papers. So, uh, but no, it, it couldn't have been all the papers. You know, as you say, there was. Uh, let me see. I had a. I have a number here. Let's see if I can find it for um, the. uh, Okay, here it is. Supposedly MUFON would have received over the contracted period $672,000. But since the funding was cut and it wasn't extended, they only received $324,000. There were also some additional expenses because his, uh, uh, we didn't talk much about Bigelow's own team at, at Bass, but he had about 50 people and they bought, um, I forget it was 40 or 45 of the MUFON field investigation manuals in order to bring them up to speed with MUFON's methods so that, because sometimes they did have people that went out on investigations with the MUFON team so they would know the standard of their investigations. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and so that those were, I think it was forty at forty five bucks each. So that that was a nice little sale from from the MUFON online store, to. Yeah, um, anybody can buy one of those. Right. I I used to have one actually. <laughs> to me, there's there's this uh, missing money 
and the scheme seemed to be get some written reports written with, that are pretty much content free and you know that's your deliverable then you get to spend the rest of it as you see fit and and I you know given that this was earmarked funds probably a lot of people at DOD didn't care is is there any any evidence that Harry Reid got what he was expecting out of this uh, I mean he seemed satisfied he seemed satisfied with the uh, with the project you know of course he didn't say anything about it at the time but since the story uh, came out in the New York Times. He talked to them and it has and been interviewed, oh, probably half a dozen times, you know, sometimes yeah. making short comments. But he's supportive of it. Um, but and but I think he's also not terribly well informed about it because he initially was saying that all much of the information was publicly available. And, you know, we've not found that to be true at all. And, and all, that's one of the things that is so frustrating in the ATIP story is that the Pentagon doesn't really have anything. Um, uh, the, the Luis Elizondo is not sharing anything. Apparently George Knapp has a stack of information that he has slowly released over the months, uh, in, usually in some kind of redacted form. So um, the, uh, a couple, one of the things that came out, or we were talked about the DIRDS, the yeah. defense, what is it? Defense intelligence research document. I think. Uh, so, so there were two of those that leaked. Both of them, I think, originally were by Eric Davis, who is an associate of Hal Putoff. Um, right. And Hal Putoff was, a, he was contracted by Bigelow, a longtime Bigelow associate, by the way. He sure. was in the earlier National Institute of Discovery Science, for the Discovery Science, NIDS, which was kind of the prototype for this, mm -hmm. I, I guess. They ended in 2004 and apparently got, sort of got the band back together to do this contract. Well, so, so put off con contracted these studies based on those same 12 topics we we're talking about. And most of those, the few that we've been able to see, and again, we've had to fight to, to get them. Um, they don't seem to be about UFOs, you know, just like what he had told MUFON to do not use UFO language, but there's one notable exception, the one by uh, Dr. Kit Green. And it's, it's about human effects, and it mentions the Cash Landrum case, some other UFO cases, and it's basically exposure to UAPs is what it's about. Now, I've been told that the version that he actually delivered was somewhat sanitized, so maybe some of the UFO references were scrubbed. But the one that we've seen was clearly uh, had UFO content in it. Right. And, and those, the, those 12, the, the main papers that we've, we talked about first, those could be those could lay on any desk and no one would say that's the UFO stuff. But when, when Bigelow moved into the field investigations and wanting the, the database, that was clearly UFO research. And but what we don't actually know is, is that what the ATIP, uh, the director, the contract, is that what they asked for? You know, we only have Bigelow's side of the story and he's not saying much. All right. But well, the, no, no, that was clearly UFO research. But we know that Skinwalker is tied into this, right? I mean, at least at the in the genesis of the program. That's right. And and so I mentioned Tim McMillan's story. He said that there is there's a lot of information in this 494 page uh, book. Apparently, it's kind of an overview of the UFO topic. And there is a section on Skinwalker. I don't think it's a major major portion of it, but at least it's represented. So it's, I would say that it is difficult to separate the Skinwalker branch from this because it's part of the inception. It's a part of in the report that they delivered. Right. And also, uh, he had people uh, stationed out there, ostensibly as glorified security guards. But what they're reporting that they didn't have very good equipment and it turns out that they may have been uh, the actual people themselves may have been what they were studying. Did the evidence does suggest that. In fact, um, I mentioned uh, George Knapp earlier. He, pr he produced a statement from a former Bass executive who we, we believe to be uh, it's, it's uh, I think it was deputy administrator. I'm not sure of the title, 
Colm Keller, who is he he was the co-author of the Skinwalker uh, book, right. Skinwalker Walker Ranch book with with George Knapp. So we know they're close. And in it, he said that they had. Did, and I, I'm going to botch the language, but in general, he's saying that they had new avenue of research where they were studying, since it's so difficult to obtain physical evidence you, and a, a, an alien spacecraft, what we can study is the effect on the human body. And he said that they were using the human body as a readout system. Right. So yeah. some people have taken the leap to mean that they're using the skinwalker ranch people as basically lab rats to see what, you know, how they are affected by exposure to whatever's there, whether it's UFOs or paranormal activity. So, and we do know that the, the, the personnel there were regularly given MRIs and various medical tests. So that does, we, we, we don't know the exact motive. We, we know what, what has been stated there. We don't know what they were exposed to. And, you know, I guess we're missing some intent there, but we have most of the rest of the picture. Yeah. Um, now, is there any direct link that shows that any of that research was paid for by the OSAP pro contract? For Skinwalker Ranch, I'm not, I'm not sure. And, Bill, well, that raises an interesting question because there were – Besides the MUFON thing, which we, we can very well trace, we you know we we don't have a hundred percent of this, but we, you know I think we've got maybe eighty or eighty five percent of it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Robert Bigelow was doing some other things to obtain UFO research. He was there were some Canadian re researchers. He had approached Chris Rutkowski and really didn't they didn't really get any, he didn't get anything out of him. But there was a there was a website and a database. I think I don't know if it's Bike or Vicky. He um, his site was bought by Robert Bigelow, and you know, in w when that happens, people probably thought it was a great idea because now it's, it's properly funded. Well, instead, Bigelow got what he needed out of it, and once the contract was over, the site went dark. So. You know, at the end, you're left with nothing, whereas if it was still independently owned, you know, it might be run on the cheap, you know, but it would still be alive, most likely. And speaking of going dark, the uh, the NID site, which it it operated, as far as we know, transparently, it, it stated the mission goals of the organization, the people involved, their credentials. There were studies that they conducted and published on the website, and that ran from, say, 1995 to 2004 when they disbanded. The website remained for a while, but when, the, when this government contract came up, the information from the site was scrubbed, and then it eventually went dark. So this is another instance where, due to this contract, we lost information. We didn't gain it. When that, that contract the government contract ended there still do you believe the general narrative that a a tip continued even though osap was gone and it was one desk at the secretary of defense it was which was lou elizondo or was is that did it go on in, in more depth i mean how did it in without funding we don't have good information i mean some you know it, remember is whenever we research cases you don't want to listen to just one story. Uh, right. And that's all we have here. We, we have what Luis Elizondo was saying, saying about things. Um, you know, and if uh, we, you know, we need, we need that verified. In, in well, well, the DOD was, has said he had no responsibilities it. with respect. Well, that's, that's what's been stated. So, you know, it's, it's very unclear and may, you know, maybe the Pentagon doesn't really know that much about it. it you know, this was such a small operation. The, the nature of it was concealed in the language and and, and the, the, they might not have even gotten the funding had they been upfront about what they were trying to do. So, you know, that was yeah. that, that something. But it was, remember this, you know, we talking about this being small, basically Bigelow's contract was the whole of OSAP. The only thing, there was a director at, at OSAP 
I know he probably was doing other things most of the time, um, but there wasn't a UFO office as such in the Pentagon. Right. And, and when he left and, it, and the OSAP contract ended, uh, apparently there was a transition to ATIP. And that's when Luis Elizondo uh, came in there. And basically, it's been called a portfolio, and he had a network of people. And he did this in addition to his other duties, which means it was a part-time job for him. And sometimes there was information collected from the Navy and other things. And other times there was, well, like, like any other UFO, there, there's sometimes dull places, dull times. And in, in the year of months, it, there, there's no substantial UFO activity. So it, it, it didn't, you know, it wasn't a daily job for him. Right. So, there, so as far as we know, uh, nobody's seen anything like a directive or uh, to, to report um, within the government report things to the A tip desk. That was that didn't exist, right? I mean, as far as we know, right? It was more uh, Elizondo going out and shaking the bushes and and asking people questions. Well, you said going out. I don't think that he did. I'm, I I I don't think that there was a proactive. UFO investigation. I think it was a network, you know, of, you know, if there was a UFO case, um, it was passed on to him, you know, at his request. But I, you know, I, I've not seen, you know, remember, we're mostly in the dark here, but so right. far there's no documentation that there was a squad of investigators or anything like that. It's, this is, this was information collecting. And just to compare it to Project Blue Book, that was, that was the blue book head sitting at a desk and they went through several, several different uh, blue book heads over the years, some of which didn't even want the job. There was a secretary, maybe another person uh, handling it, handling things or, or assisting. But most of the time when there were field investigations, they, they were just personnel from an army base that was, they said, go out and interview someone. So there was, you know, it, it was a, shoestring operation for Project Blue Book. And, yeah. and I think uh, ATIP was a bit less than that. Yeah, and it was probably career limiting to be assigned to Blue Book. The, the One thing that struck me, I, I think it was in your article, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that Bigelow, for a while at least, got themselves designated by the FAA as the go-to organization to, to report UFOs to. That's right. And the interesting thing about that is that that, stre that stretches back earlier to the, uh, the NIDS organization. And when uh, so that's that started, I think, 1996, they were listed. Uh, the FAA, FAA, like the Air Force, didn't want to bother with UFOs. So they um, they uh, were happy to turn it over to someone else. They, they also had. MUFON and uh, the National UFO Reporting Center listed as places where you could where you could call if you had a UFO report. So uh, eventually, uh, when the contract came along and and the company Bass existed, they switched it from NIDS to Bass, and they were they were at some point the the sole place listed. And from an interview with uh, Colm Keller from 2010, he talks about the fact that that uh, the Bigelow company did have a basically a UFO hotline that was staffed by a person, you know, probably just an operator without UFO experience to collect the information. And but we don't know what they did with it. We don't know how many they collected. We don't know if they resulted in investigations. That's another area where we're in the dark. But we do know that this went on for a number of years from, you know, if we count the uh, the NIDS years, that would have been from 1996 to at least 2011, maybe beyond that. But mm -hmm. that's all I can be sure about. Yeah, uh, that's probably more of a question for Ted Rowe than you, but I was wondering if the FAA still has a, has them listed. Um Somewhere. You can look on their website and check. I, I don't think that they are still listed. A friend of mine um, has, he said that he's called the number, the big old number is still active. I just don't think that the FAA is referring cases there any, any longer. But 
you know, we, we'll certainly check on that and oh, find I gotta, out. I have to call that number to find out. <laughs> I don't, I, I doubt you'll get, uh, get a chance to file a report, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, that's interesting. I, that's one of the things in your article that really struck me that they apparently went through a lot of trouble and there's a long email chain about how they, uh, they got assigned, you know, they got that sort of privileged position that, Hey, somebody calls the FAA. People call the FAA when they see something in the sky. The FAA wants, typically wants nothing to do with it. They, they, they need a civilian organization to reference to. I, so my guess is they went, probably went back to move on, but I'll have to check on that. I forgot to mention that, you know, I, we talked about how when the star team came to an end, people were out of jobs. Yeah. Well, the same thing happened when the OSAC contract was not renewed. Suddenly, Bigelow, you know, he, he put together what sounds like this, you know, elegant, elaborate, and uh, highly trained group of, of, of scientists and uh, technicians. Well, they all, their jobs came to an end. And he kept uh, Colm Keller around and, and maybe a, a, another administrator. But all the people that had been doing the, the investigation, they were gone. And the scientists analyzing things, they were, they were gone. You know, when the government money ended, so did their jobs. Hmm. As an aside, uh, I just read today that he laid off all of Bigger Aerospace uh, this week. So uh, there's, there's nobody working there now. Uh, yeah, that's a strange turn, and I, I understand that. I understand that they can't work under the conditions of the virus. I mean, it's tra- caused changes in everyone's life, but most people have not been laid off and you know put on the street. But apparently, this is kind of how he operates. Well, he's a notorious penny pincher, uh, and. Well, regarding to that, that, you know, when we were talking about the money earlier, I meant to say this. Uh, According to the New York Times uh, story, um, there were uh, laboratories and facilities modified to examine metamaterials. I'm not sure if that's how they describe it in the initial uh, initial story, but, you know, put items covered from UFO sightings. I don't believe that. (laughs) I don't think he would spend the money. To, to do that. And in fact, I don't think that, that Bass really existed as a separate company, except cross possibly on paper. And I can't, I don't have the proof of that, but I just think it would be unlike him knowing what we do of his, of the way he operates. There's, there's definitely, even though I, you know, a lot of us, I'm in the space business and I, I, a lot of us have looked at the big old habitats is actually pretty creative, pretty clever. Yeah, Bigelow himself is actually uh, quite elderly now. And do you think there's any chance he's going to just open the coat at at some point and say, hey, here's my files? It seems very unlike him. And he was uh, one of the, digging through different things. I came across an interview from uh, 2010 or 2011 where it was basically an ambush interview by uh, Jesse Ventura's show Conspiracy Theory. Right, yeah. And the, the interviewer asked him about would he share his research. And, and Bigelow kind of hemmed and hawed, but he said that he uh, he didn't see that on the horizon, and I don't think it ever will be. I don't think that's in his nature. I think he's he's collected this information for his own purposes and, you know, the, the one exception is when when he had NIDS and was working with, with people. That seemed to be open and sharing, and those days seemed to be long gone. Yeah, but there were still NDAs that the NIDS people signed, right? That's right. That, I, I'm sure that's why we haven't heard more about things. And th- that's, one of the th- that's one of the things about the story. You know, people have said, well, so what? We did know kind of know this. We kind of suspected this. Well, we have proof for much of this now, certainly in the MUFON angle of this. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten some of the people who were previously bound by NDAs to open up and talk a little bit about it. So I'm hoping that this leads to other things and maybe some of the, some of the bass people, especially since all of them are jobs now, maybe, maybe they'll see that how much information is out there now 
and it'll get get some people talking. You know, there's there's yeah. some things maybe they're still bound by, but at least in general terms, they should be able to share some information. We have here a connection that shows uh, that MUFON indirectly took government funds and provided information, some of which may have been uh, personally identifying information uh, to Bigelow. Is there a concern here that there's some kind of sinister purpose? Uh, someone's trying to to worm their way into into MUFON and and get control and, and or at least get. Uh, I mean, it, it's not it's not like the '50s when they're worried about UFO groups being a bunch of commies, right? It, it, it's a different different world now. Well, it's it's puzzling, and, and you know, remember I mentioned that the cover story that Bigelow was using, and that was essentially the same story that that OSAP was using. That they were collecting this information for now instead of aerospace commercial development, it was for weapons development. Now, was that part of was that a sham? You know, was it really about UFO information for its own sake? Was it for weapons development? Those are we just we just don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it, I don't think the goal was to infiltrate MUFON and destroy it. Although I have to say this, if it had been intentional sabotage, it couldn't have been much worse for him. Is I mean this was this was crippling to him, you know, demoralizing mm-hmm. and financially devastating. Right. Well, they never had much money to start with, and <laughs> and they were whiplashed by a little bit of a little bit of funding. Uh, you know, there's some organizations that can spend three hundred thousand dollars in a week, but um, that that's uh, it, it, but it, and, and but you know the precedent there's precedent. Um, NICAP had in its board of directors a lot of former intelligence community people. Uh, the intelligence community seems to be everywhere we look, right? But. I don't know if I can't tell if it's a sincere interest or if there's some if they're just you know trying to maintain some kind of uh control but I mean what what are they what would they be controlling it's not like Mufon's finding anything out that nobody else knows um so I I'm I find the whole bit this whole bit rather confusing uh, that it's certainly not for the purpose of learning more about UFOs but James Carrion has a hypothesis. Now, I find it interesting. I'm not ready to agree with it. He's he's I, I think his his uh, hypothesis has been called the grand deception. Hypothesis. Right. Yeah. So he thinks that the military uh, intelligence has created this UFO narrative and that's the involvement. And, you know, to what end? I don't exactly understand. Um, I don't. If he he's present in in his, his the two books that he's done he's prevented presented some compelling information I don't know if it's exactly evidence but he's there are historical cases where they have managed cases and stories not not UFO things but other other things where there are deceptions and created weapons rumors of weapons and things like that and he says this is a displays a uh, um a motive, uh, modus operandi. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And, and that he thinks that the UFO operations were run the same way. Oh, so okay. that's, that's a possible. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you look at, you know, what went on in the eighties, you know, uh, which I remember pretty well, but, uh, it, you know, everything from, from the, uh, you know, the, the Benowitz case to, MJ-12 to Bob Lazar, there seemed to be a lot of deception going on using UFOs as a kind of smokescreen. But that's not, they didn't really seem to care about UFOs. They were more interested in in creating some kind of ridicule factor around people looking into what was going on in the American Southwest. <laughs> You know, by uh, because the government does things that they don't want anyone to know about, 
out there. And uh, I, I, I don't know that, that that's not, it's never been a really clear, clearly defined purpose, but it seems to have gone on. Well, and, that's true. I, the, the one thing is that they have admitted to a certain extent of using UFOs as passive cover. When, when a, when a spy balloon or a spy plane was seen and mistaken as a UFO, they didn't want to take credit for it. So, you know, they just let the public think that's a UFO and they don't, they're not going to set the record straight and explain it. So Which, the, the question yeah. is, you know, other than the things we've heard about with, with Paul Benowitz, how much active deception has gone on? And you know, I don't think that we've got good proof of, of much of that, uh, but you know, it certainly is possible. But you're, you're right. There have been a number of government related people that just have been throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the years that have been involved in the, the UFO uh, organizations. You know, Tom Dooley was, uh, uh, I think, I think he was with the NSA. I, if if not, I apologize, but uh, he, he had some government or, um, connection there. Uh, John Schuessler was a McDonnell Douglas engineer employed with, uh, you know, McDonnell Douglas is actual em employer. He worked uh, at for NASA projects, space shuttle mm -hmm. and other things. Um, how put off did the contracts for remote viewing and, you know, there, there are a lot of people that, that were actually in the military or the uh, intelligent agencies or did contract work for them in one sort or another. So there, there's a lot of that. Right. And, and I guess we have more questions and answers of, of, when it comes to uh, that whole situation. I mean, uh, a, about a year and a half ago, I talked to um, Simone Mendez, who's probably um, not as well known as Paul Benowitz, but she seems to have been either the intended or unintended target of a disinformation ploy about ufos um but you know we'll never know exactly what happened there but uh she got in a lot of trouble with her air force employer and ended up losing her security clearance but uh you know that kind of that kind of thing is uh seemed to go on quite a lot for a while and the only question i have is is it still going on and is this all, you know, every, what we've just discussed, part of that, or or is it just Harry Reid having fun? I I really, I really don't know. Well, we've got we've got this this case that's so act, and some people think A tip is still continuing in some form, but mm -hmm. we basically we've got a warm body to examine. You know, we we don't have all the facts, but this is so fresh. We should be a, we should be able to get information on this. So many of the people that involved that were involved are still active in other places like to the stars Academy or, mm -hmm. uh, the, in the MUFON side of the players, you know, there's some of them are, are still active. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, was when, when James Carrion, when, when things fell apart, they, they basically threw him under the bus and he resigned as director and was succeeded by Clifford Cliff, but his, the duties that he had interacting with bass, with the big load company that fell to Jan Harzan. So Jan Harzan had direct knowledge of, of the workings of this contract, even if he didn't know about the government funding. So he knows a lot about this and yet he said nothing, right. you know, maybe it's the NDA, but uh, he's, it, you know, it, it's time for him to offer some sort of comments on this. Well, yeah, he's got a lot to answer for in my opinion, but uh, unrelated to that, but um you and lots of other people like like Roger Glassell you're working with and Keith Basterfield and Jack Brewer and Greenwald and a whole bunch of other dissident UFO buffs as they are possibly known uh have been really working hard dig out any fact they can so and those facts as you pointed out are not not that old we're not like we're trying to figure out what happened to Roswell in 1947 uh so there is some hope that will be able to acquire some email chains. And uh, so I, I appreciate all the work you guys have done. I, th I know filing FOIA requests and digging into digging into documents that are 
uh, that are hard to find is a lot of work and most of it goes nowhere. So very much appreciated. And uh, I hope you keep up the good work. Well, thank you. It, it's uh, and I want to I want to just to to say that Roger is was really the one that that dug into this. He has uh, he's pursued those FOIAs. He has uh, right. uh, used his uh, journalistic credentials to to query the Pentagon desk for the and apparently that's kind of a rotating door. He's on the third spokesman now, and uh, unfortunately now not only are they uh, backlogged, they're dealing with the uh, the virus that's preoccupied everyone else. So that's brought the information to a standstill. Yeah. Now, Roger's dedication, you know, is really what, what brought this all together. And, you know, he's, uh, he's tenacious. And so, you know, I just want to, I I've done my own work, but without him, you know, we wouldn't have gotten there. I, I'm an admirer of that work. I don't get to a whole lot myself other than looking into some of the dirds, the background of the dirds. But uh, as you pointed out, it's going to, any FOIA request right now is going to, be crawling along at best so um yeah so anyway uh kurt uh we didn't get to talk much about um about cash landrum uh but that you know i i uh i think I, I i'm happier sticking to more modern times uh i remember that case when it first was publicized uh but i i've always had I always wondered about some of the aspects of it, but um, oh, it's a great mystery. Yeah, I well, people can dig into your about, blog and and learn a lot from that. I, I I'm sure. Uh, the, what what I've what I've done, I've had pretty good luck over the years with it with uh, digging up documents on that, and they're right. all hosted at the site. And there were some from the te Texas Department of Health. There's the original MUFON case files. Yeah. There's correspondence between the doctors. There's so there's a there's that, that's the thing I'm particularly proud of. It's the documents I've collected and shared on on the blog. So yeah, I do hope anyone that's interested in the case, yeah. there's a lot of resources there for you to say. So that's uh blueblurrylines.com. Uh all one word. And right at the top there's a little tab where you can click on Cash Landrum UFO case documents. So anybody's interested in that, then I think that's the place to go. In fact, I, I would first place I'd check if I would want to know more about that case. And uh, I think the, what ties that case in is that uh, you just wonder if it might have been one of those kinds of of tests that went wrong that that they deliberately played up the UFO angle to try to put a little bit of ridicule on on the whole thing. But as far as we know, the witnesses were completely you know, I'm working under their own volition. So uh, that certain that hypothesis is not not established at all. But the the witnesses certainly sincerely believe that it was some kind of government project, and they you know they're no longer with us. They went to their dying day. Uh, yeah. You know, emphasized and that that it was some government. There was at the very least it was government involvement. If with the helicopters that accompanied the, the, the UFO. So it was either, it was either government project or it was a government pursuit of a UFO, but there was government involvement from their point of view. Absolutely. And they felt like, uh, they never had their, um, uh, well, they literally didn't have their day in court. They had wanted to, to sue the government. And I think that they, they did feel like they deserved, uh, compensation for the problems with their health, but they wanted the case aired publicly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Vicki Landrum had said, you know, would you settle? And she said, no, I, I would really have a hard time doing that because I want this story to come out. So, you know, regardless of whatever the truth is, that's what the lady said and apparently felt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's an inter it's interesting from, from that angle. Also interesting fact that, John Schusler was heavily involved in the the MUFON investigation. So, uh, well, I think we're going to leave that at there. I, and I encourage people to go to your site and and have a look at all those documents. And uh, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Th well, th I'd like to thank you, Kurt, for your time. And it's been uh, we're clearly in a point where 
we don't know everything, but we know a lot more thanks to you and your other your fellow researchers and and uh, hopefully we'll be able to eventually uh, clear a little of the fog away. But uh, I don't well, know. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, our our work, uh, you know, Tim McMillan's article helped get us started. You know, we may not break the next news. I don't expect that we will, but I hope that somebody will build on our research. You know, keep asking questions, going after documents, interviewing the people involved. I think we're going to get more. We may never have all the answers. No. And, and hopefully we'll solve this and can work on some genuine UFO mysteries instead of this backstage drama. Yeah. But you know, I think it's all important to have this, this straightened out. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It, it, you have to, you have to clear away the noise as well as boost the signal. So uh, I'll put links in the show notes to both of your articles with Roger Glassell, as well as your regular blog and also the Tim McMillan article and anything else I could think of that's relevant. And folks should go and read this stuff for themselves and ask questions <laughs> and hopefully better, better questions. So thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'm going to say good night now. Good night. All right. Good night. I'd like to thank Kirk Collins once again, as well as all the other researchers who have looked into this whole business, most of which do it purely out of wanting to dig into the truth and not for pay. You probably have some unanswered questions after all this. We all do. If there's anything I can help with, please feel free to email me at apicasefiles at gmail.com or report a UFO at protonmail.com. You can also contact us by going to our website, reportaufo.org, and clicking on the Contact Us tab. You can find the show notes for this conversation, number 18, by going to apicasefiles.com. If you have a UFO sighting you want to report in confidence, please visit reportaufo.org and fill out the form there as soon as possible after your sighting. We don't just collect sighting stories. We investigate and do all that we can to determine the facts of the case and to rule out common explanations when those facts permit. By the way, we could use some volunteer help from someone who is really database savvy. We want to turn our case data into a well-organized and useful research tool. We are not there yet and need advice. I hope We'll see you again soon for another API conversation with some of the most interesting people in the field. In the meantime, please check out some of our earlier conversations with people like Joshua Cutchin, Mark O'Connell, Jack Brewer, and Kevin Knuth, and many more. The music for this conversation was by DJ Spooky and George Hrob. All music was used with permission. We release API case files and API conversations under the Creative Commons Attribution License. This is your host and producer, Paul Carr. See you next time.